Hello everyone, my name is Clément Fournier again and I'm, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Media You Matter, the Media of Global Transition. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to host this debate today about uh, facing environmental chaos with courage. Uh, I'll have with me a lot of uh, very interesting uh, speakers. Uh, I'll try to introduce them the best I can. Um, just next to me I have uh, Judy Wahungu, that's how you pronounce it, right? Correct. You're Kenyan ambassador to France and former Minister of the Environment of Kenya. That's correct. <laughs> Miren Bengoa, you're a, a UN Women Friends expert. Uh, so I think you have links to the uh, Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation. Um, I have some uh, speakers online. I don't know if you hear me well. I don't have any sound right now. Maybe it's the live problem I just have an image right now okay uh, so now I see Luis Mabulo your entrepreneur and winner of the United Nations environmental programs uh, youth Cham young champions of the earth award hello I'm pleased to have you uh, on the on this live uh, Jean-Maurice Ripper your ambassador of France and uh, Raphael yes. Toots uh, director of global solutions at UN Habitat hello I, I don't hear the, the speakers. I don't know if, uh, if, it's, if, it, if, if there is a technical problem or not. Okay. So let's start this debate about uh, facing environmental chaos with courage. Uh, first, I, I'd like to try to define what is environmental chaos and maybe what is courage regarding to the ecological crisis. So. During the last uh, few years, the, w the world faced a lot of environmental damage, like more floods, more uh, uh, wildfires, uh, more storms. Uh, is it what we, called, what we can call uh, environmental chaos, uh, do you think? Maybe, Judy, if you want to start with it? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this event, to allow me to have the opportunity to participate with such distinguished panelists. Climate change is the largest, biggest, and most challenging problem that we are facing today. I would agree with you that it is chaotic because we are coping every single day with extreme weather. So planning becomes an issue. So in that case, I would agree with you and say that yes, it is chaotic. But at the same time, as people, as human beings, we must plan. We know what is causing climate change. We have the science, we have the technology to cope with it. And we also have the cooperation of all of us as human beings to be able to cope with climate change. It is chaotic, but we have the ability to manage it. Miren, maybe you want to add something about this? What, what would you call environmental chaos? Uh, is it like the, the environmental catastrophe we, we see more and more, or is it maybe conflicts that are caused by ecological disaster? What do you think? Uh, what, what do you think is environmental chaos today and maybe tomorrow? Will it be worse? I don't know, I'm just asking questions. Well, as a, as a social scientist uh, by training, I would always say it depends on the perception of the people we're speaking about. Probably a few centuries back, um, extreme weather conditions were perceived as uh, issues from, from gods or from uh, uh, foreign forces. Now we have science to understand them. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, we uh, seem to think that we can be prevent, that those, those events can be preventable in a certain way. So maybe the perception we might have today of what is chaotic is what goes beyond our capacity to control. And therefore, what we would like to do, and the conversation today might help, is to distinguish between those events that we have enough uh, mastery over and with which the communities can build resilience uh, compared to those situations that might be so uh, unpredictable that we have uh, little to prepare for them, yet we still have to be uh, facing them now with courage. So that's for the debate of today. Thank you. Uh, maybe to, to follow uh, Jean-Maurice Ripper, uh, what, what would you say that we are living now in a, in a world of environmental chaos and how would you define the, this chaos? Well, thanks. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Do you hear me? Uh, is it okay? Yes? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I fully agree with what has been said before, except that I'm not sure it's 
chaos. We have been warned. We have been warned since the Rio conference in 1992. Every year we have the reports of the uh, IPCC. So we know exactly where we stand in terms of climate change. And today we have to add, of course, the uh, challenges uh, caused by the loss of biodiversity, which seems to me today perhaps the most difficult challenge because we know the link between the loss of biodiversity with the rise of pandemics, as we have seen uh, this year, desertification, access to water, and I have no doubt that human conflicts will be, if not started, um, exasperated by those um, environmental uh, challenges. So it seems to me that today we have been warned, we know what has to be done, so time is no more for conferences, time is for action, and time is for action for governments, of course, but also for civil society in no field form. Uh, NGOs, press, the medias, international uh, corporations, everybody knows what has to be done and the answer, the reaction to those challenges have to be collective, that's for sure. Thank you. Uh, Louise, what is your thinking about this topic? Do you have anything to, to add? Absolutely, and thank you for bringing up this question. I'm in complete alignment with all of our previous speakers. I mean, our, our environmental reaction is just really a reaction to humanity's overconsumption of our planet's resources without balancing the environmental stewardship. And we see with the triple planetary crisis, we see climate change, global soil degradation, and pollution that run rampant in our day-to-day -day realities. In fact, I live in a country that's one of the most vulnerable places to hazards brought about by climate change. And year after year, I see the chaos of the typhoons and storms that impact my way of life, along with the way of life in my community. And to be not intervene, we can anticipate these effects will just be faster in the coming years. But again, the next few years, especially the next decade, is our window of hope for a just ecological transition in restoring our planet. Thank you. Uh, Rafael, do you have uh, anything to add to this, to this topic, maybe? Thank you, and thanks for inviting you and Habitat to this important debate. What I would like to add, I agree with all what uh, the previous speakers have said. We have been warned. But that doesn't make it any less uh, dangerous or dramatic or chaotic. And I, I would like to draw the attention to the fact that there are some groups in society who are already uh, much more fragile than others and who will have more issues, more problems with this chaotic environment. And specifically, I'm thinking about the one billion people living in informal settlements who are already vulnerable in terms of their location, in terms of their poverty situation, and in terms of their marginalization from the mainstream society and economy. So I think we need to always think, keep in mind that some groups will be more vulnerable than others in this chaos. Thank you. Um, so some of you said that we have been warned about the, the chaos that will come with the environmental crisis. Uh, I'm just wondering, what do we know today about the challenges we will have to face, to face in the next few years? Do you know if we do we know if we have to we will have to face more more floods, more wildfires, more uh, uh, extreme heat uh, event? Uh, do you know where this will happen? Do we know where uh, which people will be the more vulnerable uh, again, facing these uh, these challenges? What, what do we know? Do, do we have a, a good image of what we will have to face in the future? If some, some of you want to, to start, maybe Jean-Maurice or I don't know. Yes, of course, we know. I think all of the speakers have mentioned one or another of those challenges. But I fully agree with the representative of UN Habitat. We have to understand that the the less protected part of the population in the world is the most exposed to the risk that we are facing. 
And it means not only the country in the south, develop, developing countries, it means also huge parts of these of societies from richest of the richer country. We have seen that already in the US or in Europe. You can see that every time there is some catastrophe, it's always the same part of the population who is suffering the most. And this is why our government has to target, our governments have to target most of their measures for those people. But once again, I really think that biodiversity, the loss of biodiversity, is very is the key problem because it increases all the other environmental crises. And we really hope that the uh, two-part COP15 in Kunming and then uh, next spring, the second part, will be able to come with strong commitments by all governments. And I really hope that, for my part, from my country, that France and the European Union will commit themselves even more than they have done today, even if we have to recognize that the European Union has done a lot already. Judy, do you want to add something to what Jean-Maurice said or to the, the topic of uh, the challenges we'll have to face in the next few years? Uh, yes, I do agree with uh, Jean-Maurice in, in pointing out the importance of biodiversity. I have always said that the very existence, our very existence on this planet called Earth depends on our biodiversity. And this is what we are destroying. We are destroying the foundation and the building blocks of why we exist. The pandemic of 2020-2021 has shown and exposed our vulnerability. When it comes to the issue of climate change, we all must remember that this year, 2021, we have seen more places in the world than ever before experiencing 50 degrees Celsius. That is mind boggling. That is mind boggling. If this is not a wake up call, I seriously don't know what is. Miran, maybe you want to react to, to what Judy just said? Well, uh, indeed, we have the data and we have even the very recent facts uh, showcasing other varied catastrophes and disasters that uh, populations are facing in the north and in the south at the same level of gravity. But as uh, Mr. Ambassador Rupert said, we need to make sure we create uh, the capacity to respond. And in that sense, I think looking at who the vulnerable populations, the most exposed ones are, in, with regards to uh, their accommodation situation, with regards to the training and capacity building that they might benefit from, the resilience or uh, prevention plans that might be in place at community level. And of course, in my role uh, in UN Women, we always stress the fact that uh, it's also about giving the skills even to individuals as much as to the communities to be able to anticipate alert and bring uh, enough activism uh, to the forefront uh, to make sure governments will react on time. Uh, if we come back to the issue of women, we know that uh, any situation might affect them double. First of all, because they will have uh, issues of mobility, maybe issues of um, being able to express themselves publicly or even to um, make their, their priority about saving their own life with regards to uh, their uh, families. So we have to make sure we understand the underlying factors also that make these disasters as bad and how we could ensure the prevention systems and the response systems uh, will be even better designed. Louise, maybe you want to add something about this topic of vulnerable population and how you can uh, clearly identify what are the underlying factors of the their, uh, their resilience or lack of resilience uh, uh, um, about the environmental challenge uh, that we'll have to face in the next few years? Absolutely. I mean, my work itself is grounded in empowering our farmers to be more climate adaptable and resilient because we see on the ground that some of the most vulnerable populations are the least aware of the impacts of their work or their actions. And in fact, they're not even a major contributor to a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide because they simply cannot do that. Um, but it's also a fact that 
through all the numbers and statistics that have been mentioned, these are real people and faces who are suffering year by year through the impacts of climate change and environmental disasters. And it's really important that we give these people a platform to not only learn about it, but also represent themselves and um, share their stories and the real, uh, the real uh, everyday situations that they face in, in the face of this climate crisis. Thank you. Raphael, maybe you have something to add about this? So I think what we, we need to uh, note very strongly is what the IPCC was saying in their uh, latest report, is that the scale is increasing, the speed is increasing, and the intensity is increasing. And it's not going to go down until at least mid of this century. So this means that adaptation is a must, it's not an option. There's no quick fix uh, possible. And what I'm worried uh, about is that currently less than 10% of the climate action finance goes to adaptation. Should be much more an equal divide between adaptation and mitigation action. Well, that's the question I was about to ask. Uh, we, we always talk about attenuation and how you can reduce the greenhouse gas you emit, how you can uh, reduce the impact on biodiversity, but what do we, what do, we do today to adapt to the fact that the, environ the environment sorry, is already changing and that the climate reality for, our, for tomorrow is different for, from the one we have today? What do, what do we do concretely to adapt to the, the new climate reality, the new ecological reality? Do, do you think we, we do enough for this or not? Raphael said 10%. Do you think it's 10% uh, of the, the efforts are going to adaptation? You think it's uh, it's enough, or you think we should go higher and uh, give a lot more money and financial uh, support to this uh, to this adaptation? Uh, if I may, first of all, we have to be more transparent about climate finance. Uh, many of us were living here in Paris in 2015. We spent our month here in Paris and signed with ululation and just delight about the climate accord and the, and the, clim uh, and the Paris agreement. Mm. There were over 190 countries here and we were extremely pleased. Commitments were made, a hundred billion dollars per year since 2015, most of which have not been committed at all. So the part of the world I come from, people are talking about environmental justice. We are the victims of a situation that we did not cre create. So where is the environmental justice? And people are tired of the words. People want less talk and actually more action. That's what people are asking for. So even as we are participating in the COP15, and now moving on to COP26, uh, people are talking about loss and damage. So it's just not adaptation. What, where is the justice? And so loss and damage. Um, it has been mentioned that climate crisis and other environmental chaos is causing insecurity in many parts of the world. There are climate refugees. Mm. There are ecological damage refugees. These are issues that are huge and that we need to deal with them. And I know that all the representatives on this panel have great experience. Everyone is doing their part, but really at the highest levels, we need to see that commitment. I can assure you that COP15 is not going to be easy, even the two-part component, and neither is uh, COP26 in Glasgow, because people will be asking, where is the action? And, and what do you think is lacking for this action to take place? It, it's maybe the lack of funding. You, need, you think the, the Green Fund should be more financed by the developed country in order to help the developing country uh, uh, face the loss and damages and uh, adapt and, uh, and create new environmental policy, for example? Absolutely. You've just answered the question. This is, what we, this is what we've been asking for. And so I think transparency in terms of how the funding and when it will be available, is those are the questions that are going to be posed 
uh, come COP26. Miren, maybe on this topic of environmental justice, you have something to say? I'll, I'll pick up the argument uh, from the issue of funding, actually, from that perspective. We know that uh, all the uh, global agreements are based on government support, majoritarily. But we also want to put forth the capacity of private donors to also play their role. Um, I, I contribute in a, in a foundation that has a, a, a major footprint in Africa working on microfinance institutions and how they have been at the forefront of supporting micro entrepreneurs and farmers, micro farmers or larger mid-level farmers to uh, resist in a moment of uh, ecological damage but also facing the pandemic which was a social and sanitary issue which affected also their capacity to produce. We have to look at it from both perspectives indeed, looking at where the money can come from in terms of correcting the flows and transparency is a key and accountability coming with that. Uh, now that the commitments have been made and, and quantified, how do we keep those governments accountable but also the corporates who are uh, in large uh, proportions responsible for some of those uh, gas uh, emissions but while at the same time putting the onus on what can we do now here locally. Each and every country can find local solutions to uh, build their own uh, protective measures while protecting their people, their ecosystems and the biodiversity as well. Yet it is a global challenge and we want to ensure the dialogue continues. Uh, even very extreme protests that happen in front even of very uh, very developed countries' governments. I'm speaking of Switzerland, where I live now. We have ex ex Extension Rebellion uh, standing in front of our parliament these days. Uh, it means that it's a global movement for justice that youth and young people are, are really uh, wanting now, demanding now, with strong words and actions. Jean-Maurice, maybe you will, you, you'd like to, have to add something about this? No, I, I just would like to react, of course, we all agree with this notion of environmental justice. The question is, how do we reach that? And I think we, we should question also sometime our own behavior and the demarche we have followed until there. What is key is to agree around the world on objectives in the long term and to be consistent in the action on the long term. And it's difficult for governments because the population in each country very often want contradictory things. We will have the presidential election in France in six months and we'll see that. There will be a lot of very good ideas, commitments, Request for commitments on environment, climate change, biodiversity. But at the same time, the people will request action by governments, which will make it very difficult to abide by the commitments regarding environment, climate change and biodiversity. I agree with the, uh, the fact that, of course, the money which has been promised, $100 billion, should be paid. But what is also important is the way it is used. For instance, France has made a very important decision. I'm, I'm not saying that to... I'm retired, so I, I don't talk on behalf of the government. But the French agency, l'Agence Française de Développement, now is spending each and every penny on green projects. It is in its bylaws. And this is the kind of thing which has to be generalized all over the planet. And we also have to make it clear that on the receiving side, we have to have governments which are ready to use that money for green purposes. Let's, I don't know if we can speak about particular countries, but if I refer to Brazil, and the question of deforestation and the Amazon, we all understand that it's not a question of money coming from the developed countries. It's a question of 
What do we do when we have a president in this country who is refusing to act for the protection of the, of the forest? So I think really now the time is no more for committing ourselves to unreachable objectives. It's really a question of day-to-day -day work. And I like what the previous speaker said about microfinance and microprojects. We also have to empower the population on the receiving side in developing countries to use the money that would be committed to green projects in a way which is compatible with the objective of the international community. And if I make the last point is there, of course, the United Nations system is key because it can mainstream those objectives. This is, the ob this is precisely the objective of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030. We also have to go back to the institutions, to the United Nations, and stop acting only at a bilateral level. Judy, I saw you reacting uh, about what uh, Mr. Ambassador said. He, about the, the responsibility of the developed countries versus the developing countries and internal policy versus international policy. You, you want to add something or...? I, I simply agree with what he's saying is that the, the onus is on both sides and that, you know, we, the developing and emerging countries who are the biggest victims of climate change, mm. also need to put measures in place. Mm. Uh, also what Miren has said, you know, how do you address those that are affected the most, and she has already given a very good example of how women also bear the brunt mm. of these challenges. How is the, the funding uh, used, and is it for the right measures? And that's really the onus of the implementing country to ensure that the governance and the environment in the recipient country makes sure that the intended beneficiaries are reached effectively. Mm. Louise, maybe you want to contribute to this debate about how do we make sure that the fundings go to the right place and the right people at the right moment to address the issue? Oh, definitely. I think um, on the end of funding, I think it's really important as well that non-state actors play a role in creating and keeping transparency and that maintaining that culture of transparency throughout environmental processes. And people, of course, exercising their procedural rights and developing and empowering grassroots level people to understand the value of this funding and where it should be going and how much its value and worth is, especially in impacts, um, whether it's planting trees or uh, creating villages or creating resiliency among these and how we can sustain that for the long term and not just streaming funding down into communities but actually maintaining that and making sure that it continues to have an impact uh, beyond just streaming the funding down and implementing the project. Um, also, I think it's important right now with youth participating and creating these synergies and creating a culture of environmental protection uh, within their communities and creating that new dynamic when it comes to actually investing funding and creating transparency and using all of these different opportunities like online um, social media platforms, especially during events like typhoons where we use that not only as response but also as a way to keep people in check and understand uh, the transparency measures behind streaming funding down into the down onto the ground and using that as response for climate related disasters. Thank you. Uh, Rafael, maybe you have something to, to add about this, uh, uh, what has been previously said about uh, environmental justice or uh, uh, how we make sure that the, the funding goes to the, to the right places and uh, to, to solve the right issues? Yes, I, I believe that indeed environmental justice or climate justice is the moral that we need to follow. It's not perhaps a legal uh, principle difficult to enforce, but definitely it's the moral principle that we need to, uh, our actions need to be guided by this principle. But it should not be something that paralyzes us. Action needs to continue. And I would like to give an example um, of the country where I'm living in Kenya and I, with the permission of the ambassador, last week we were uh, celebrating World Habitat Day in Old Korea geothermal uh, facility in Kenya. So Kenya is a country that 
despite being on the victim side, invests very heavily in green energy. So it takes a leading role in also addressing uh, climate action. And maybe another point I would raise, while climate justice and environmental justice is a very important point, we should avoid that we're doing more harm still now. And we see every day that still harm or potential harm is being done. For instance, building in floodplains. This is creating new vulnerabilities for the future. And this happens both in the north and in the south, where cities are expanding, towns are expanding in floodplains, creating more vulnerability for the future. So I think we need to stop doing more harm as well. And, and to stop doing more harm, what, what should we do? Having the courage to, to face environmental chaos, is it uh, to put new regulations in place and uh, new, new laws and new norms to maybe ban some activities? Uh, um, what, I what is it concretely to, to, that we have to do to, to make these changes happen? Maybe Miren, if you want to, to react. Yes, definitely on the issue of boldness. In fact, what is the gauge we're looking at? Are we looking at making something that will linearly reduce an impact uh, of uh, too many people uh, settling in informal uh, locations which are flood prone? Uh, or is it radically moving to the systemic mm. changes that are needed and making sure we stop doing those things that we know are harmful? Uh, it's uh, really a new moral compass, as uh, Raphael Tufts has mentioned at the moment. Environmental justice is a fundamental right. It just has been written into uh, the global uh, convening and conventions uh, at the Human Rights Council today. It's a very important day for, for, the, for humanity, for that matter, today, uh, to acknowledge that living in an environmentally sound environment has um, is, a, is a human right, pretty much. So uh, making that uh, the uh, level of standards that we want to put forth, not only in uh, local activism, not only at intergovernmental uh, diplomacy level, but also making sure that norms, policies, standards, inclusive of trade standards, are brought to that higher level of uh, acceptance, building on the knowledge that has been gathered, the data, the science that showcases, and all the impressive technology that is out there um, that is allowing us to monitor from satellite view what is happening in the fields in Kenya, for instance. It's an amazing progress that is now at our fingertips, yet is not exploited, not used necessarily to make the good decisions. Judy, maybe you want to, to react? <coughs> Um, of course, I agree with everybody, but I'd just like to thank Raphael for mentioning uh, Kenya and what we are trying to do with green energy and all carrier in particular. Uh, it's a, one of our geothermal energy stations. So what Kenya is doing is diversifying its energy uh, uh, profile. And uh, as we speak today, about 70% of our energy is renewable. That is a commitment that we've made because of our NDCs, but it's also part of our energy uh, security measures. The issue of uh, you know, environmental justice, climate justice, it's not going to go away. The, you know, what Miran has already uh, mentioned is absolutely uh, important. What we need to do is to continue just to pull up our socks, uh, to put early warning measures in place, but also rapid response measures in place at all levels so that we can secure our communities. In going and invading riparian margins uh, is madness. But we also we know why people are doing it, because they're doing it because they have to somehow secure their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. But governments have to find solutions and provide alternatives for people. Invading riparian margins invading protected areas is also quite dangerous and we know it and we know what it does but governments must provide alternatives and this alternatives must be provided every single day uh, when i was a minister of environment i used to not only enact 
very tough measures, but I would also, once we had assented to the laws, I would tell my teams, it's now obsolete, because there are new challenges every day. So don't, don't celebrate that we have a new law. Let's make sure we're implementing it, but it's also obsolete, because that was yesterday. This is today. We are facing new challenges, and we must continue to all do that. Well, I, I can't help to think that what we are doing today to face those challenges is far from being enough and that we are going too slow. How do we make this acceleration? Uh, did you have any, any idea what, what is lacking today for governments and for uh, private sector to act more, br more boldly on, uh, on climate change and ecological crisis? Is well, it money? Is it, uh, what is it? it? It's all of the above, but as all other uh, panelists have intimated, it's the partnership, the partnership of government the partnership of civil society, the partnership of the private sector, and then just commitment from all of the above to uh, improve the condition. But also, like I said, we're going to be facing these challenges every single day. But all partners must roll up their sleeves and just get to it. Find those solutions. But all decks on, or all, all hands on deck is what is needed. And we're beginning to see improvements with that. We're beginning to see at the multilateral level, the bilateral level, more engagement hmm. uh, from all leadership. Louise, do you have something to say maybe about this uh, need for a partnership and for more action? Uh, anything to add? Really not much to add. I think uh, everyone has already said it and consolidated these ideas so well. I think it's just important, as, as a previous speaker mentioned, that you know we need to create environmental protection and regeneration as a standard and not as an add-on, but an expectation. And policy frameworks will obviously need to address these issues, but also as individuals, we need to take action and hold accountability as well as help in the enforcement of these um, interventions on a day-to-day -day basis because of course the climate uh, the climate crisis is a reality but we should also make it part of our lifestyle to address it. Mm. Rafael, maybe you want to add something? So I would like to comment on this how to accelerate and I believe we need to do two things at the same time. First, we, uh, you refer to the issue of regulations and standards. We need to gradually lift the bottom raise the standards, both in terms of environmental protection, in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation resilience, gradually lift the bottom through regulations. At the same time, we need to encourage, particularly the private sector, to also lift the ceiling. That means uh, innovate so that we get cutting edge technology that can show us the way to really make um, a very major jump forward mm. so that you have the whole practice is moving uh, moving forward but at the same time innovation shows us the way in the long run okay but, but do we have time to do this you, you said gradually uh, uh, as if maybe we we have a lot more time to do it but if i read the ipcc correctly uh, I see that we have to, to curb our emission right now and we should already be uh, going down with our, uh, with our CO2 emissions. Uh, do we have time to make the government gradually increase the regulation and then the private sector gradually increase the, its, its standard? Uh, shouldn't we make like broad decision and fast decision right now? Uh, even if it's hard and if it, if it requires more courage to do it? I don't know if you, yeah, well, you can, uh, of you course, can it has to be realistic because you could also see social and economic repercussions that are dramatic and that could, um, you know, create even more chaos if you go too quickly. So I think we need to follow the pace that the society is able to also follow in different uh, contexts. I mean, imagine, for instance, concrete is a material that has been around for more than a hundred years. It's a very good material, but it also um, has creates a lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. You cannot change this material overnight into another material. You need really to stimulate innovation by the cement industry to gradually change its material by something that is performant 
and that can help us and that has less emissions because that material is not yet available as we speak. Okay, but so for some things that could be avoided right now, for example, food waste uh, or uh, overproduction in some countries, uh, isn't there any, any laws that we could, uh, or any regulation or any action that we sh could take right now? Maybe, maybe someone could, uh, could give an insight about this, uh, Raphael or someone else. Uh, do you think that we are uh, sometimes taking too much time to take actions in some sectors that we could address right now? Maybe Jean-Maurice, or uh, if someone wants to add something. I want to, to react on what has been said before. Yeah. It is very important to be realistic, as uh, the representative of UN Habitats just said. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, there is no quick fix to the crisis we are facing. We have to go in all the directions which have been mentioned at the same time. Stop harming. There you can make decisions which are very clear, clear cut. Stop exporting our waste from the north to the south to, to put an end to the plastic continent which is polluting half of the oceans in the world. Those are the kind of things you can decide. But please, we must understand that uh, we have to get, we have to empower the population in the south and in the north and we have to get the, uh, the uh, approval of the population. If we want to preserve democracy and the rule of law, let's not tell to the people that there is a quick fix. This is exactly what some mm. regimes are claiming all over the planet. They are not doing anything more than the other ones to preserve the planet. We can always say that we will do it tomorrow. It's not true. We have to understand that it is, we are facing something that the next generation will have to live with. So the question is how to find a way, the ways of empowering all the actors which have been mentioned, civil society, media, uh, uh, private companies, governments, preserving our capacity to share the action, to share the objective and to share the action. And this is once again why I think the multilateral level is very, very important. The decision which has been mentioned about uh, the resolution passed today by the Human Rights Council is key. And once again, the United Nations system has to be reinforced to put some pressure on governments. We cannot just do it with goodwill, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. You all talked about partnership and multilateral level, and I was wondering, uh, if, when you read the IPCC reports or other reports about environmental crisis, you sometimes see that the, the ecological crisis will uh, increase the risk of conflicts of uh, local or international migration, uh, of uh, res conflicts around resources. Um, do, don't you think it will be harder and harder to find ma partnership and to create multilateral relations in this context where everything will be more tensed uh, regarding geopolitical uh, relations, regarding uh, uh, border relations, regarding population relations? Um, what is your opinion on that? Maybe Miren, if you want to, to start. We have to look at it from the opportunity perspective. Uh, we are emerging, not yet exiting, a crisis situation which was related to COVID-19 pandemic. And amidst this crisis, there were so many positives also that emerged in terms of the speed with which we found a vaccine, for example, mm. uh, the speed with which uh, some people adapted work-wise to changing circumstances. Uh, some of the innovations that took place. Of course, there were many downsides and the loss of life being the, the worst of all. But we were uh, very uh, concerned and globally uh, brought together by this objective of fighting the pandemic. Uh, how can we maintain this level of energy? How can we uh, look forward to find that multilateral agreement level? Consensus building is so time-consuming, we know that. Yet facing a circumstance that is 
led by an emergency like the one we just experienced, uh, possibly we can find, uh, again, I'm going back to my same argument of local solutions, uh, global standards, local implementation. We cannot uh, operate other, otherwise than through the the key word here, which was mentioned many times, which is empowerment. And empowerment comes with education. It comes with participation. And it comes with acknowledging the resources that exist within the local cultures and, uh, and environments. So we, we want to work through those that lens of building from the crisis into an opportunity to do better together. Judy, maybe if you want to contribute about this, this topic of how do we create more multilateral relation and partnership in a context where maybe conflict will be harder to avoid and uh, how you can find local solutions to global problems? Do you, you want to add something? Well, this is a key question you know, for us as Kenya now because uh, we are a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Hmm. And uh, even as we speak uh, now, Kenya is chairing the UN Security Council for the month of October. You know, it's a rotational uh, uh, chair for the UN Security Council. Our head of state, President Kenyatta, is in New York now uh, addressing members of the Security Council. One of the key themes that Kenya is focusing on this month, but you know, throughout uh, when we um, uh, were uh, chosen to sit on the council was the issue of climate change, peace and security. That is absolutely critical uh, to us. The fact that environment, uh, the ecology, or uh, we are dealing with this issue of ecological sources of conflict, and that the climate change, the environment, are a key uh, driver of the conflict that we're going to face uh, in, in, in future. So what do we need to do? First of all, at the multilateral level, we need that commitment to peace. Uh, as you can see, there is turmoil in certain pockets of the world, even as we speak. And the only way that can be dress addressed is at the multilateral level and also at the regional level. But also, as Biren has said, is that people need to be empowered uh, because people understand the climate in which they live, the conditions in which they live, better than any one of us sitting in the capitals. People are very innovative. And so if we empower the people to be able to sustain their livelihoods, even under this stress, it will also reduce conflict uh, at the regional level and also at the international level. Mm. Raphael or Louise, maybe if you want to, Louise, maybe if you want to add something uh, about this topic of partnership and multilateral relation and how do we, how can we, improve this multilateral relation in the context of a conflicting and chaotic, chaotic world? Definitely. Um, looking back, especially during the pandemic, a lot of our work was actually rooted in local solutions, which is something that we're adapting to merge into our work. In our effort to transition forward, we need to reach back into traditional ideas and mindsets and actually consult the people who are largely affected by it. Um, in the event of typhoons, we have immediate typhoon responses. And we also train on disaster preparedness for local farmers. But also in the middle of the pandemic, when supply chain lockdowns were at their, at their peak, really, we worked with the local government to figure out how we could support farmer livelihoods and provide aid to people in need of it, um, especially good nutritious food. So we bought everything from local farmers and localized supply chains, which happened to be what was already being done years and years back. But because of expansion and because of uh, you know trade routes and everything opening up, it was it was something that was forgotten and taken for granted. And then bringing all that, all that back into our modern age was something that turned into a priority. And now we want to move forward with that model and hopefully make it into a model that is better for food systems and helps reduce crime rates and helps improve nutrition and helps actually support livelihoods of people who are in need of it. I think um, in the conversations earlier, in climate response and protection of vulnerable communities, we need immediate urgent action that happens now because these are lives being affected day to day and these are children going to sleep at night without food in their stomachs because of supply chain breakdowns or because of disasters. But in just transitions, in creating new models and frameworks for resiliency and climate mitigation, we need that slow transition. We need to build those partnerships over time and we need to have, as, as mentioned, uh, we need to actually have that democratic process 
process. But that is for creating a slow revolution within uh, food systems, within climate, within environmentalism. But in reaction, in addressing the disasters right now, we do need urgent action, which doesn't necessarily have to be isolated to governments. It can also be done by non-state actors, NGOs and entrepreneurs and young people who are working at the front lines to do something in reaction to this. Okay, th thank you. Uh, Rafael, maybe you want to, to contribute and add something about this? What I'd like to say is about this uh, climate migrants. It's very difficult to pinpoint whether the migration is a direct result of climate, whether the climate has contributed to a crisis, a conflict, and then the migration happens. What we try to do is to look at the receiving communities, the local authorities who are faced by an influx of people who are not from their own country, but still have to deal with them in terms of housing, in terms of health, in terms of education and jobs. And we try to work with them to be more inclusive and to integrate these international migrants into their communities and find good ways forward, which are mutually beneficial. Second, I would like to uh, stress the importance of working also between different levels of government. We know that already more than 10,000 cities and local governments have committed to quite ambitious climate action. But sometimes this is not recognized by the federal government or the national government. So the collaboration between different levels of government is critical to make quicker progress in this area. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Maurice, maybe a last word on this, uh, this question about the, the necessity for partnership and multilateral relation and maybe decentralization of, uh, of decisions? No, I think everything has been said and I fully agree with what Rafael just said. The importance of local governments and the in-between layers of, uh, uh, of societies in the receiving countries. It is very important for each and every one to commit itself in a converging way. This is why, once again, I really strongly advocate for the reinforcement of the UN system and of all the agencies. We need to be focused and to be focused, it's always better to act within this a common framework. I have been for more than a year, a special representative of the UN Secretary General in Pakistan at a time where there were massive floods. The need for action was somewhere between two and three billion dollars. The UN system received 300 million dollars. Each and every country wanted to act alone, following its own way choosing its local partners, imposing its own rules. This is what we have to stop doing. We have to empower the UN back. And, and do you think that right now in the international or national process that are trying to, to, do, to, to take some actions about uh, the environmental cr crisis, those uh, layers of government and those uh, civil society members and those NGOs uh, are, uh, are uh, do you think they, are, they, are, they have a good enough place in the, in the process? They have their, their voice heard in the, in the international conferences or in the, the national policy design? Or do you think governments need to, to, to g give them more space and, uh, and hear their voice um, more? Maybe Miren, if you want to start. Well, I remember working closely with the C40, which is the consortium of 40 major cities of the world. Mm. Uh, the passion that the mayors were putting uh, at that time to uh, set high objectives for uh, different environmental issues, including mobility in cities, reduction of pollution, air pollution, reduction of um, transport uh, by, by car and by, by trucks. Uh, but there are so many issues that can be addressed locally. Um, but unfortunately, in many circumstances, the federal laws or the national laws will prevail. Uh, 
Um, so indeed, going forward, uh, more decentralization, allowing for a rise in the standards and the obsolescence of old practice uh, is an is, um, organic movement. And we know there's a tipping point when over 30% of a group starts adopting a new way of operating be it now in Paris, everybody rides a bike, even though it's dangerous, but they will still do it now, uh, was not thinkable before. Uh, so many countries can show the way and how to make this a safer uh, and positive change for citizens, while at the same time keeping li the living together atmosphere still uh, positive. Um, so the, getting the innovation at the right level and the cooperation mechanisms uh, come along with more uh, freedom as well. Judy, maybe on, on this topic, do you think uh, uh, cities, uh, regions, uh, NGOs, uh, civil society uh, have their place in the, in the debates right now or do you think they need to be heard more? I think it changes from country to country. Mm. And also, I think from my experience, it changes on the issue to be addressed. Uh, in some countries, um, particularly in emerging countries, there's just... Uh, uh, a, sus, sus, not, a, a very uncomfortable relationship sometimes between the civil society and 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 the and say the the national uh, government or or federal government, but when it comes to issues of responding rapidly to an emergency, uh, then usually there is more cooperation. Uh, but I would say going forward, with all of the challenges that we are facing now. Uh, my prayer is that that this cooperation becomes more of an automatic working relationship rather than one where there is push and pull and tension, you know, now and then. That's just my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Rafael, maybe you want to, to contribute to, to this? No, I think I've... Uh, <laughs> I agree with what uh, what has been said. Uh, there is no, you don't have the luxury uh, for different groups in society to work alone at this stage. It's far too urgent for this. But maybe I would like to end my contribution with a positive note. Between now and 2050, about three quarters of the infrastructure that will exist in 2050 still has to be built and this is an enormous opportunity that we have and that we should not uh, not waste and of course with the COVID-19 um, reconstruction there is another opportunity that is combined so we should really take this opportunity to put the direction uh, and um, work with all, all different partners together to work in that direction and take advantage of this opportunity. Okay. Uh, Louise, um, what do you think about this? How can we make the, the NGOs, the civil society more heard in the debates and the decision process uh, about ecological transition? I think that there's already been a lot of work um, done in terms of including NGOs and, you know, more civil societies and actually even youth members. And recently in Milan for the Youth for Climate uh, discussions where we created the proposal for COP26, uh, where it its voice is being heard from different industries and different sectors from around the world. I think it's just a matter of making sure that these voices are heard, they're given a platform, and that we actually work together to, you know, align and create, build these synergies that actually uh, would have positive contributions. But also noting that the, within these partnerships, we also have to make sure that there are nuanced differences. So, with, for example, the working group documents, there are different nuances for Global South countries or developing countries within Asia, for example, as opposed to European countries. And for different people, they have a different uh, stake in this or a different amount of risk and vulnerability when it comes to these discussions. So it's really increasing representation of those countries that are more greatly affected and continuing to build those synergies and uh, really build those partnerships over time to make sure that equity is, uh, is accommodated throughout these discussions. Okay, uh, we just spoke about uh, increasing dialogue and multilateral, multilateral relationship and, uh, and partnership and uh, giving a voice to NGOs and civil society. Uh, uh, on this topic, I would like to go back to, to something uh, Jean-Maurice, I think, said uh, at, the, at the beginning of the debate 
uh, about the the fact that sometimes government um, need to need to take decisions that will be maybe unpopular or maybe that some uh, some some citizen or citizens in general have sometimes contradictory uh, expectations about government about ecological transitions. Uh, we have a good example here in France about the the yellow vest, uh, the gilet jaune. Uh, the government tried to to take a, a bold decision with increasing the price of uh, the prices of uh, of fossil fuel, uh, and uh, it turned out to be a, a really harsh decision for uh, for poor people that took. Uh, uh, a burden of uh, of this uh, of this tax increase. We had a lot of demonstration in the street. Uh, how how can we improve the dialogue between the citizens and governments about these issues? How can we uh, I don't know uh, how can we spark the courage uh, for political leaders to take uh, bold actions like this, but without harming poor people and having some kind of uh, ecological justice in the, in this debate? Maybe Judy, if you want to, to start. Um, the way Kenya has addressed this issue is that public participation is a constitutional right. It's in our constitution. So before any major decision is made, the question will be posed, did the public participate? And did you cover the entire 47 uh, counties of the country? So it's a, it's a constitutional right. And I've seen in the last few years, since the, the Constitution is 2020, so it's still a, a work in progress, but I have seen more transparency in terms of deliberations, more issues that, people, uh, that are important to people being brought to bear so that the government sitting in the capital just doesn't make the decision. The question is, did the public participate? This is improving the dialogue, and it's also improving the quality of the decisions. So is it a, a, some kind of uh, improvement in direct democracy that you, you want to, to propose? Yeah, absolutely. It's already there. Okay. You know, so any decision that you make, the question will be whether you're facing uh, the National Assembly, Parliament or the Senate. The question will be, did the public participate? And it's very important. Uh, even at the Attorney General level, it will be questioned, did the public participate? And during the, the debates, on how some of these decisions are made. A member of parliament could say, you did not come to my constituency. So the views of my constituents who elected me were not addressed. It is a work in progress and we've seen that we make better decisions as a result. Miren, maybe to, to add something about the... Well, we, we won't compare political uh, constitutions or regimes, but it's true that from a democratic perspective, Switzerland is a good example of uh, putting to the people uh, most of the key decisions that the country will um, enforce. Uh, it's obviously not feasible in very large, uh, large countries, but it makes sense to create new platforms and new vehicles for that public participation to take place. Uh, of course, digital tools are out there and we're voting about you know, the ratings for whatever new movie and, and the popularity of whichever food we, we put out there. And, and, and we're not necessarily expressing our voices on key decisions that affect us on a day to day. So mm. there are ways to build this um, uh, participation uh, and it doesn't have to be through protests necessarily, yeah. which is a reactive yeah. uh, approach. We want to be proactive and pro possibly the European Union, we're sitting here at the Maison de l'Europe, uh, is a model for that and should be more of a model of setting out public consultations uh, and, and in one way or another. And you think that something like the Citizen Convention for Climate in France could be uh, an example or a model for this kind of uh, participatory Provided democracy? the recommendations are followed. Yes. <laughs> That's the problem right <laughs> now in France. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, Jean-Maurice, you want to, to add something? I'm not a politician. Huh? I was a diplomat, so my, my I can only you are. from my experience. Uh, uh, Perhaps I would like to stress two things. Uh, getting the opinion of the people is very important. But I slightly disagree with the last sentence about the convention we had in France. And I think it was unique in the world, except for uh, Quebec, the province of Quebec did something like that a few years ago in Canada. Uh, people have to express their will. But in democracies, it's up to the parliament and the government to make the decision. The fact that everybody says what he wants is needed. 
but it's not enough because to be implemented it has to be uh, transformed into laws and regulations with the means to implement it and this is one of the difficulty in some areas it seems to me regarding to climate change we all want something to change but to, to say it is not enough it has to be concrete and there i would like to address two questions which are difficult and sensitive first for the international community the first one is to believe that precisely democracy is weak because too many people express too many ideas and that strong governments and authoritarian regimes will be better equipped to make decisions for the international community. This is not true. Because in authoritarian regimes, we can see around the planet, I don't need to name them, the wish of the population is completely disregarded. It's only about private interest or party's interest, about money. It has very little to do with what the, the population is expressing. Usually there you don't have NGOs, you don't have a free press, and you don't have public opinion. So we have to think in terms of democracy, and I think what the ambassador of Kenya said is very uh, interesting, and we have to respect the way that Kenya is trying to find its own way to build a democracy which is very original, it seems to me, taking into account people's opinion, but it's still the parliament which is making decisions. And the second thing which in my view is important uh, at the international level is to stop believing that consensus is the way to move forward. Consensus means that everybody agrees, which means that it's the lowest common the, the highest common denominator, which mathematically means the lowest level of agreement. We have to go back to the idea of making compromises. This is what and how is built the European Union. I give you this, you give me that. And then you can build a consensus based on compromises. We cannot get everything immediately at the same time for everybody. And this is where, again, all level of powers, central governments, parliaments, Local governments, mayors, members of parliament have to agree on making compromises. And in our societies, it's quite difficult. And let's recognize that the social networks doesn't make it easier. At the same time, it's easier to express your opinion, which is good. But at the same time, it's an incredible way of trying to impose some sort of common will be, uh, because it's used mainly by the people who have the strongest opinion. So the balance, equilibrium between what is possible and what is wishful is very difficult to reach. Thank you. Uh, Raphael, maybe you, you want to add something about this topic of uh, uh, direct democracy and empowering the citizens in the public debate and giving them a voice uh, uh, in, the, in the public decisions? Yes, I believe we need to reflect on the notion of subsidiarity in the context of environmental chaos. Of course, subsidiarity means that you try to bring the decisions to the lowest feasible possible level. But we are facing a situation that's a global crisis. So the what and the direction, I think we need to accept as a given. But the how, how are we going to address it in each community, in each municipality, that needs to be decided or the decision has to be consulted with the affected people so that they become owners of the way to implement this overall vision about better protection in a situation of um, environmental chaos. Thank you.
Louise, maybe you want to add a word about this topic? Well, as someone who is not part of the government and um, or any public se uh, public sectors like an I.O., I believe that, well, the public does need to be made aware of their procedural rights. And I'm just echoing everything that everyone has said, um, that this is a very complex topic. And we all have rights uh, to either procedures or being able to report or send proposals to our local governments. It's a matter of exercising that and making sure that we demand for change. As uh, Maron, Maron said, it's not necessarily uh, through protests, but actually through legal procedures and just transitions or even building your own projects at the local level because a lot of um, impact that can be made in the short term can be done easily at the local level but again uh, through these transitions it's knowing that just proper transition and change isn't something that happens overnight or something that receives applause in the moment but it's something that is uh, through difficult decisions that have to be made that don't necessarily please everyone, but are necessary to build equity and betterment for all, even for future generations who we don't even get to meet yet. Thank you. Uh, we, we just have a, like a, a few minutes left before the end of this debate, so I'll try to have a look at the questions the public asked uh, online, because uh, some uh, people can uh, ask questions directly live on, uh, on YouTube and uh, other social networks. So there is a first question uh, from Isabel. I think some of you already uh, answered the question a bit, but I still act, asked it to, to, to try to clarify a bit. She's asking, is the key for ecological transition to act at the local or the international level? I think we already answered a bit that it's the articulation of both, but maybe if someone wants to add something about this, uh, or, or we stay with that kind of, uh, of consensus. Uh, maybe uh, Raphael, Louise or Jean-Maurice, you, you want to add something? No, it's okay. So I, I'll go to the next question. It's Evelyn who asks, uh, is the, the 2030 agenda ambitious enough in order to contain environmental disaster and climate change, in your opinion? You have uh, any thoughts on this? Maybe Ju Judy, if you want to start. I don't think it's ambitious enough. You know, as, as I've said, when it comes to all these conventions or all these strategies that we have, uh, we always face new uh, situations, uh, surprises, emergencies. Um, it's a good document, it's a good strategy, but then we must articulate it even more. Um, 2030 agenda is fine. The African Union went to the 2063 um, uh, agenda. So um, very good um, strategies to follow, but let's amend them uh, to make them even more ambitious. And how do we do that? For example, on uh, I don't know on the issue on climate change. For example, what is the how should we amend the, the agenda? Well, I mean the, the issue of climate change is, is what we have been discussing. That yeah. the situation is dire. Yeah. The situation is absolutely dire, and you know people on the ground will tell you that you know we you scholars just keep talking, and you keep bringing documents. We are dying. You know we are dying. That is really the reality. So they don't want to hear about 2030. They want to hear about how are we going to respond now? That's the reality. Miren, maybe on the 2030 agenda, do you think it's ambitious enough or do you have any opinion on how do, do we improve it to make it uh, uh, good enough to address the challenges we have to face? Well, with only nine years to go, I think it's absolutely not to put into question the objectives that were set out, but to see how we can accelerate their achievement, the funding required to achieve them, and especially the inclusion component, which has come forth so drastically during COVID-19, is the fact that we cannot have objectives that are decorrelated from the people who are going to be impacted directly. And making sure we hear their voices, we make sure we look and and ventilate within societies also to hear the voices of the unheard and stressing the fact that indigenous populations are very um, invisible uh, still on those issues of biodiversity preservation and uh, ec ecological transitions everywhere. We want to make sure uh, as civil society actors and uh, there is an agenda. It has many things to be improved around it and it needs acceleration uh, yet let's keep our eyes on the ball and uh, work together to achieve them yes 
Uh, Raphael, this, this question reminds me of the answer you gave uh, before on, on the debate about gradually improving the, the standards. Do, do you think uh, right now the agenda is, uh, is ambitious enough or do you think we need to improve it and uh, how fast? Uh, do you have any opinion on that? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think there will be a chance to review the strategy in a couple of years' time. But for now, we know that many of these 169 targets are already lagging behind. And we look at the dashboards of the, the whole set of uh, uh, Agenda 2030 targets, and it's actually not looking very good. But on a positive note, there are some targets that have a positive spin-off effect on other targets. And we need more to look at those targets and those actions that can address multiple issues. For instance, if you look at education, looking at inequality and energy and health on how you can uh, create actions that address multiple targets at the same time as a way to accelerate the 2030 agenda much faster. Thank you. Maybe, Louise, uh, if, if you want to contribute to this question of the Agenda 2030. Yeah, I mean, we are living in a very intersectional world now that is constantly evolving at a pace much faster than we can keep up with it. So completely understanding that documents and all these strategies in the 2030 Agenda itself, uh, in a few years' time, it may it may not completely cover, even right now, it may not completely cover all the issues that we would want, but I think it's a matter of being able to follow suit and understand the vision and the goal that we want to achieve and make sure that that is actually implemented on the ground and that people can feel the impacts of it. Thank you. Maybe Jean-Maurice to, to, add, to add the last word about the, the Agenda 2030. I, I think I would agree with, uh, especially with Myron and Louise. This is what we have. We have to to stick with it. Uh, the best is sometimes the enemy of good. Let's go for it. Let's improve it. And once again, each and every government, each and every group of governments, like the European Union, is free to do more. Mm. And I'm thinking, for instance, it has been mentioned the C40, the uh, organization of the 40, 40 largest cities in the world. We are going towards a decision by all those cities to forbid, uh, I don't know how you say that in English, uh, non-electric cars yeah. in, the, in towns mm. in the year 2030. This is a decision which has been made, for instance, in Paris. I think Rome is also going on that, London. Uh, so each and every part of the population which has been mentioned during this debate can always make some decisions going in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from James and he asks how can we take into account the young generation's su suggestions when designing public policies aimed at tackling climate change and the major environmental disruptions? I think it's a, it's a bit like the debate we had before about uh, engaging the, the citizens in the, in the democratic process, but it's, at the same time it's a bit different because they, he, he's talking about the young generation that sometimes don't even have the right to vote or to politically contribute right now. So it's indeed a good question because many of the things we decide today will affect them and maybe not the people voting right now. So how can we, it's, it's hard for democracy to tackle this issue. Do you have any insight on this? Maybe Judy or I don't know. I'm just asking you because you're close to me. Uh, again, just uh, uh, speaking um, on behalf of, the, of course, the country I represent, which is Kenya, is that the, the youth are very much engaged. Um, you know, with the, fr from the leadership of the president, he has made sure that uh, in many task forces, uh, many committees that he has appointed, that the youth voice is engaged. But the youth are also in our, in our face. Uh, they're very um, direct about the fact that people of our generation and before have negatively affected their future. They're very uh, direct about that. The youth are also taking advantage of the technologies and the digital world that we, we live in to organize uh, globally. Um, the uh, Friday for Futures is, is now a global uh, movement, and there are many, many others. 
uh, like it, where the youth have organized uh, to make sure that they take the role of safeguarding their their future. So the question about the, the futures from the perspective of Kenya, definitely they are being heard. And the little time I've spent here in uh, France and the other countries that I also represent, I've seen similar movements uh, where the youth are vocal, uh, the youth take the time to understand the issues uh, that are challenging them and their future livelihoods, and they make it heard. Mm. And they're very aggressive about it. But at the, you said they are being heard, but at the same time, if I'm talking about France, for example, I'm thinking about Greta Thunberg, who went to France at some point, and uh, a lot of people said, yeah, she, she should stay in school, uh, she's too young to talk about this uh, hard political issues. Even when she came to the UN, some people in France uh, voiced against her because she was too young. So it seems to be kind of a difficult issue for the, the, the youth to be heard in this, uh, in this topic. Uh, and I'm wondering how we can empower them and how we can uh, make, uh, uh, sorry to say it like that, but older people uh, take the time to hear the youth and the young people. Maybe Miren, if you want to, to, to contribute to this, this debate. Well, there are many mechanisms that can allow for that participation depending on maturity levels and age and uh, literacy and mm. uh, languages. And there are many, many barriers to participation that we cannot uh, list now. Uh, but ensuring first, uh, uh, as Louise has mentioned earlier, that there are platforms, be they digital or physical, uh, and that uh, those recommendations that stem from these uh, challenges, pools, um, whatever petitions that are out there, change.org is one that organizes mm. constant petitions, um, which gather a lot of support, millions of people sign up to those. Uh, but we also have to uh, inform uh, this young new citizenship of their uh, duties as well as citizens. And I think there's um, a, a push and pull movement at the same time of participating, but at the same time also respecting the rules that are in place, allowing for this debate to take place um, in good conditions. Um, but yes, creating more innovative ways of hearing uh, what young people and younger people have to say, especially in environments where girls are unheard, for instance, uh, for many reasons, they're out of school, they're married too early, or they are already uh, raising a family when they're still children themselves. Uh, and, and those circumstances need to be addressed at the forefront as well in order to uh, hear everyone's voice. Louise, maybe if you want to, to add something, since maybe you are the, the, the youngest of the, of the panel, you have a, a strong opinion on this? Definitely. I mean, I've personally participated as a young person in many of the procedures and processes that have gone into it. For example, um, here in Southeast Asia, there was actually an expert group meeting organized by three UN agencies to actually demand for the rights of children and future generations to a healthy, clean and safe environment. And on those panel were young people from different parts of Southeast Asia who had the opportunity to speak and place their demands forward that were put into the procedural processes that went into the document. And even recently in Milan with the Youth for Climate, 400 young people gathered to create a zero draft, which will be proposed to COP26. And there are several groups, for example, the UN major group on youth that represent young people that you can easily reach out to and either approach or speak to or email if you have any concerns or uh, specific points that you want represented in these discussions. And even the UN has a youth envoy who has been doing phenomenal work in raising youth voices on these platforms. And I think it's just a continuous process of doing research, informing yourself and understanding what needs to be done on the ground and understanding the procedural processes that go into these documents and policy frameworks. And isn't it, isn't it something that should be maybe taught in some schools or more taught in school? Because I, I don't know, when I was in school, there was no really, uh, no, no real classes about how you can participate in, uh, in political activities, engage in, uh, in associative work. There were no real uh, classes about uh, how you can uh, use your time to improve your, uh, your community conditions. It was only about teaching math and French and history. Uh, or mostly, uh, maybe I'm a bit of a caricature saying it, but uh, do you think schools should have a major role in, uh, in transmitting this, uh, this, uh, this knowledge and the skills? 
Absolutely. I think education is the foundation of this. A lot of young people are impacted by what they learn in schools. And so environmental justice and these procedural rights and all of these things should be integrated into school curriculums. And at the moment, it's not in every school curriculum. Maybe some schools do have it, uh, but there are resources online because now we are a very connected generation hmm. that does allow for young people to either learn about these or uh, even platforms that are being developed by foundations and NGOs that teach young people how you can actually participate in a meaningful and non-tokenistic manner, which is extremely important. Uh, but I think it's really using the internet and all these devices that we have to spread good uh, information and actually be able to practice our rights, but also to look into all these opportunities and resources available to us to express our demands and concerns as young people. Thank you. Jean-Maurice, maybe you want to, to contribute to this debate about how we can uh, hear the voices of youth more and uh, empower the youth to participate more? I'm the oldest member of the panel, <laughs> so it's quite difficult for me. I just remember the time in, uh, in the 70s, 70s when the, uh, w the Club de Rome issued its first report on the risk um, of uh, the, crisis, the energy crisis coming because of the way we were consuming. I fought with my parents to convince them to buy a small car with a very low consumption of oil instead of buying the big ones they wanted to buy. I'm not saying it's easy, but uh, one of the difficulty is to accept, to try, and it's difficult to talk with others. I mean, demonstrating among young people is good, but their problem is to reach out for older people not staying among themselves. So I agree with everything which has been said. But working with associations, using the uh, social networks, working with the UN forums, uh, creating clubs into the school, putting some pressure on the older one. And as we are entering some electoral uh, campaign in France, the youth has to use their right to vote, to impose try to impose the agenda they are interested in. Because we cannot at the same time in democracies explain every day by the hour that the political uh, elites and the members of the parliament are unable to cope with the issues and refuse to vote, saying that I'm not interested. So it's a very complex issues and process of associating, creating platforms for the youngest people to be able to feel that they can be part not only of the expression of the problems, but also on the research for solutions. But it's maybe because political leaders took so long to understand the problem and took so long to try to cope with it that the youth now lost interest in politics because they lost uh, they didn't see how it can improve their lives and how political could act on these issues. So maybe there's a responsibility for political leaders now to rebuild this trust and show the youth that uh, they are engaged in the process and they, they will effectively do something and not, uh, and not um, wait and wait and wait until the problem magically disappears or, or put it on the next generations. Rebuilding trust, it's an issue, uh, really, I, I guess. You, 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 Go ahead. Now somebody wanted to take the floor. No, no, it's, it was just me uh, talking, so you can uh, go ahead and... Uh... No, 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 I agree with you, but once again, uh, I was in Rio in 1992, where we signed the first international convention on climate change. So it's not only to say governments have to change. Governments will change if the population, if the voters, if the companies, if the youth, if everybody asks, requests and puts some pressure on them to change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Raphael, maybe I will give you the last words of this, uh, of this conference because we are uh, arriving at the, at the final moments. If you want to add anything about the engagement of young people. Yes, I would like to broaden it a little bit. Um, we have said a lot about young people's participation with, and I agree with everything, but let's look at it as a matter of social inclusion. We also have children 
we have um, elderly people who can also be vulnerable in their own right. Let's try to make sure that all the, the social groups are probably included in the decision making. But specifically about youth and young people, and we see this trend of involving young people in panels, in um, parliament, in different forums. We need to be careful that the young people that we invite to these forums are truly representative and that they don't represent only a very narrow niche of the society, sometimes an elitist uh, group of young people. We need to make sure that young people are speaking for all the young people in their constituency. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you all for coming tonight and having this very interesting debate uh, uh, live on uh, the Rencontre du Développement Durable. I'm very pleased to have you here. Uh, as you, you understand, this debate is very complicated. We have to find the, the sweet spot about uh, uh, acting fast, but at the same time acting realistic. We have to engage more and more people, find the vulnerable people and engage them in the process and help them uh, go through the challenges of a more chaotic uh, world. Uh, I, I hope you learned some things today and I hope you had the opportunity to express your views on this topic. So thank you very much for coming uh, and thank you for following us online uh, uh, to, to throughout the day. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you.